And now, the Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. Here are your hosts, Brandon Staten and Tyler Hensbro. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Sleephawk Worldwide Podcast. This is Sleep Dog with the big hulk. What's up, everybody? It's a rainy day out, but we had a great podcast. We're going to bring you some sunshine. Uh, happy to be in the studio with my guy, Sleep Dog. Uh, yeah, so let's get it. Guys got all kinds of stuff to get into. Obviously, coming off of a you know disappointing loss against Kentucky and Atlanta, got Oklahoma up next. Heels lost two in a row. We'll unpack all that happened uh, in that game. We'll look ahead to Oklahoma at the Jumpman Classic. Kind of pick that one apart. Talk about what we think uh, the outlook is for the Heels right now, and uh, you know maybe even be a little more prepared than usual. At least Sleep Dog is about uh, Oklahoma and what they have on their roster, get into this little Draymond Green situation a little bit because it's cool, kind of an interesting parallel between this whole MMA thing. These dudes just brawling in the, in the stands. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And MMA is something I'm not, what is it called? UFC, not a super huge followers, kind of like, you know, WWE, except real kind of. So, uh, but anyway, two dudes just fighting it out in the fan in the stands the other night. we got a segment for the first time, contender pretender segment. I'm going to go through the NBA, NFL and NCAA and ask the big Hulk, whether the teams are contenders or pretenders. So we'll get to that. Uh, it'll make for some easy talking points. And, uh, but before we get into anything, let me just, uh, we hadn't done a t-shirt shout out in a while. And, uh, my man, Jonathan Burnett, Canton, not Ohio, not Hall of Fame, but Canton, North Carolina. Didn't know there was such a thing, but Jonathan Burnett did because he lives there. He got us a T-shirt. So T-shirt shout out, something we hadn't done in a while. And also Connie Nelson, Oceanside, California, man. She bought two T-shirts a long time ago, and I don't think I ever shouted her out. And uh, she also came on our website and gave us a donation. So, hey, Connie, shout out. Oceanside, California makes us really feel, seem worldwide, too, because Oceanside, California – like that seems like I don't know, man. Imagine if you live somewhere and you're like, or somebody's like, "Where are you from?" Like, I'm from Oceanside, California. <laughs> like, oh damn, dude, your life must be great. Uh, mm-hmm. And I, the crab cakes, man. I'm trying. I almost, I almost trip myself into. Look, dude, best Christmas present in America. Um, I almost, I fumbled there because I almost fumbled. Sleep dog is is doling out. Jimmy's famous seafood box for Christmas, but I almost just started going in and Hey, listen, man. I mean, I think some, some people might be getting them or maybe kind of listen to the pod. So I got to be careful about that, but Hey, it's Christmas. You're going to order them. I mean, this is coming out Monday. You better go ahead and get your order in. Cause those, some bitches going to start slowing down, uh, closer we get to Christmas and definitely don't want that thing sitting on your doorstep three or four days or anything like that. You know what I mean? So, only thing, uh, best crab cakes are fresh crab cake, and damn Jimmy's will get them to you. So go online and order them. Uh, sleep to our uh, Big Hawk dude. He had great, uh, <laughs> great promo on his Instagram the other day. Get you a toboggan. You go out there and order. But anyway, nobody gives a shit about that except us, and you should too. But uh, UNC against Kentucky, Big Hawk. Um, lots of turnovers. Lots to unpack there. Close game. So, you know, we said before we got started that that starting with the UConn game, really the Tennessee game, I guess this was going to be a stretch run that was really going to tell us a lot about what we had. Well, we've lost to UConn, we've lost to UK, we got another ranked opponent coming up in Charlotte on um, Wednesday, I think, in Oklahoma. So, you know, hey, look, man, we played them close, um, had a chance at the end, couldn't pull it out. So I don't know, man. What are your thoughts, and and and, and um, you know, how do we unpack this? Well, when you watch the game, to me, in my opinion, I felt like Kentucky actually controlled the game, a majority of the game, but I never felt like we were out of the game, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I'm watching it, the only time I actually thought, um we were out of the game as the last minute. I didn't mm-hmm. feel like we executed down the stretch like we needed to. And Kentucky's a very talented team, but also they're very young. And they've showed spurts this year where they can play with anybody. They can also lose to anybody. They just lost to UNCW in Rupp. But also they played 
Kansas right down to the wire on a neutral court earlier in the year. And the one thing that I was really looking forward to is they have a kid who just came in and got eligible. I don't know if he was dealing with an injury or eligibility issues. Uh, Aaron Bradshaw, who Mm -hmm. is a big that potentially might be a lottery pick coming up. And I really felt like he made things hard for Armando. And Mm -hmm. I don't think Armando had a game where he walked away being extremely satisfied with. I thought RJ brought his scoring. I think RJ has been, you know, what he's doing this year has been, you know, pretty consistent. He's given us scoring about every night. And I don't think Harrison had his best game either. Harrison's been giving us a huge lift. He's been playing well all year. Uh, Didn't have his best game, but also Cormac Ryan played well for us. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, what what I would like to see is obviously you want to see us execute better down the stretch, especially if we're an older, more veteran team. And specifically, I'm talking about the last play where we came out of a timeout and Cadeau threw the ball to Cormac, and Cormac wasn't even looking. Easy turnover. Um, If I'm looking at it from that aspect, I I was a little frustrated just because um, (laughs) – you know, that was right after a timeout. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a much needed possession. I felt like that's where I was like, ah, the game's pretty much slipped away from us. Mm-hmm. But also watching the game, now a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on, they question, hey, I'm talking about this play as well from Kentucky's perspective defensively. Do you foul up three um, late in the game towards the last second to prevent – um, the other team from making a three. And that's always been a big coaching debate. Okay, are we going to foul, make them go to the line, shoot two, or are we going to chance and let them have the possibility of making three and tying it? And I thought Cal actually made a really good decision in letting his team play. Mm-hmm. And whether you know they called a timeout and he told them to foul or he didn't tell them to foul, uh, it shows you that if you rely on your de- defensive principles and you have defensive discipline, it's going to pay out. You don't need to overcoach your team. And I thought that was a good decision from Cal. But ultimately, we got to execute better down the stretch. I felt like if we have normal production from Armando and we get Harrison Ingram what you know, being what he's been all year, I feel like we can win this game. Mm-hmm. And this isn't to take away – the story for me – is isn't that UNC lost to Kentucky? It's that hey, Kentucky is a very talented team mm-hmm. that has the potential uh, to make a run come March because they are so young, and it kills me to say that. It actually pains me because <laughs> if anybody hates Big Blue Nation, it's me. I can't stand their fan base, but I do say I give Cal some credit. I think this team is going to develop and get better and better as the year goes on. They're extremely talented. Uh, they have lottery picks, and I think this team. If they grow and evolve, they could be a team that could be scary in March, even with their lack of experience. And I, I'm not, you know, my head's not, I'm not too disappointed in the team because I think that a lot of guys who we've relied on most of the year didn't have their best outing. And I hate that that happened against Kentucky. And, you know, I, I'm glad that we have a chance early on in the year. Uh, to make these mistakes and then learn from them. I could tell the guys were upset. That's one thing Mm -hmm. I was really happy to see is like, hey, that really bothered Cadeau that he messed up, made that Mm -hmm. turnover late in the game. And I feel like that's something that's going to motivate him and also make him pay more attention to going forward, and that's going to give him experience. Okay, it's okay to make mistakes early on. And, uh, you know, Cormac, who is a more veteran player, 25 years old, he's a fifth year Mm -hmm. playing college basketball. Um, You know, I feel like – you know, <laughs> basketball 101, always know where the basketball is, always have mm-hmm. on the basketball. And whether they were going to run a play or not, it looked like the play was designed for Cormac to go set a down screen on RJ and come off uh, a pin down for an open shot right there at the wing, which, you know, I'm, I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, shooting a three. I always think, hey, in these situations, just go straight to a, to the hoop and get a layup. Teams are so paranoid about fouling, it's almost easy money right there. And I know it, it kind of makes you have another possession to try to get the basketball, foul, and you can end up in the same scenario. But, uh, you know, that's just kind of what I take away from this game, Sleep. And uh, we can dissect it. We didn't have our best, mm-hmm. you know, 
outing in a lot of areas. We had a lot of turnovers, which, you know, it's it's not like the turnovers I saw from last year. And I think our body language is better. You know, last year we had these lackadaisical, just unforced, no one was guarding us, just turnovers. I was like, that shouldn't happen. You shouldn't just mm-hmm. have like an a easy casual pass that just gets picked with no yeah. ball pressure. And I didn't really see that from these guys this year uh, so far, and it feels like we're sharing the ball more. Uh, but, um, you know, let's, let's also keep in mind, Kentucky's not a bad team. So that's yeah. what I take. So you- <clears throat> And super early in the game, I remember looking, and it was like there was a lull there for the first 11, 12 minutes of the game where we were not playing well. Both, both teams, I think Kentucky, both teams seem to have the jitters out of the gate. I think Kentucky sort of got on its feet, got it a little sure of itself faster than we did. Um, and, you know, early on, so, you know, we had 17 turnovers. They had 14. 17 too many, like no other way around it, right? But I do think four or five of those came very early on. Two of those were, were RJ, you know, not realizing that he was, um, you know, too close out of bounds line. And, uh, you know, he had five. This is the biggest thing of that 17. He had five and Armando had six. And that's, that's, that's what I come away as a, as a challenge, right? Like, cause we talked about this way back in the early stages of the, of the season. It's like, Hey, you've got a veteran team. You've got, so you've got your guys, right? And, and then you have to have, uh, the who's going to step up guys mm-hmm. when, you know, RJ or Armando doesn't have their best game, right? I think to your point, Harrison didn't have his best game. I think Elliot Cadeau probably had his worst game of the season, right? And then, and then Armando, at least statistically, I mean, nine points, six rebounds, six turnovers, gotten some foul trouble. Although I thought a couple of those were at least one of those fouls was, I mean, questionable is, 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 uh, is being yeah. kind, but you know, nonetheless, and these aren't knocks, right? I mean, you're going to have bad mm-hmm. games and it just was kind of like it collectively. They had it at the same time and to, to still be, I mean, there was a point in this game where I was like, dude, we might not score 50 points. You know, and then you kind of look down in the second half and you're like, all right, damn, this game's in the 80s here. So, you know, I think to your point, you know, getting out rebounded was tough. Um, yep. I thought, you know, and it was weird because we got out rebounded and, and, and we got out rebounded when it counted. Mm-hmm. But as I was watching the game, I was like, man, it just seems like every ball is just like landing right in their hands. Yep. And, and And I think sometimes like that's what it amounts to. We didn't have our best game. Um, and you know, the ball just didn't seem to bounce our way. I don't really think there was anything. I thought that the shot clock situation at the, or the, uh, the game clock situation at the end after we had, um, I think that was after we had made the, the, the mix up on the set call to get RJ, the ball was when they inbounded. I don't think the clock started fast enough. All of a sudden, you know, instead of that being a shot clock violation, it's two free throws for Bradshaw. To his credit, he mm-hmm. steps up, hits one, right? Missed the first one. And we're like, damn, we might still get a shot at this. Yep. Um, but aside from that, you know, I felt like it was a physical game that never got out of hand and both teams played it tough. And yeah, I'm with you, man. Like, and, and we also said there's going to be, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of parody. We've lost three games. And I think the good news is, is that we lost against three really good opponents. I mean, yep. Kentucky's going to be top ten. UConn's top ten. Villanova, I don't know if they're in the if they're. I know they had a, a couple of tough losses. I think they're the type of team. I mean, it's Villanova, right? Same thing yep. if you play us on a bad year, like um, you know, you can lose that game anytime. So, you know, look, is it time to hit the panic button? I mean, we'll tease that until later. Um, I don't think so. Oklahoma is is who we have next, and we're gonna we'll get into them in a, in a second. Um, you know, they're another. They're probably gonna be in the top ten when um, you know the poll, if it hasn't already come out, is out. And um, you know, there's I think that's a that's a game that I I, I think where everything I've seen from us and everything where I see where we're at, I feel like we should win that. And yeah. um, you know, we talk a little bit about that too. But I'm with you, man. It's like it's a bummer. Um, Feel like um, some of our more accomplished teams would have would have won that game easily, yeah. um, but you know even this team, I think we were in it and could have pulled it out. Yeah, sleep. I just want to say real quick as I look through the stats, 
first of all, the last time Kentucky beat us, um, was it 2017? Uh, Malik Monk went off at yep. like 50 something game on us in yeah. Vegas. Uh, later that year, I think we beat them in Elite Eight uh, mm-hmm. off the Luke May mm-hmm. shot where Theo Pinson ran down and actually a, picked his dribble up and had nobody, couldn't see anybody, and actually saw Luke in the corner of his eye and passed it to him. Well, Luke made an unbelievable mm-hmm. shot, arguably one of the biggest shots in Carolina history. We went on yep. to win the national championship that year. Uh, but also, uh, just keep that in mind. I'm not sure you're saying we're going to win the whole thing this year, <laughs> but uh, if you're looking for something to take away and to be ultra positive and you know everything is positive in the universe type mentality, that's one way to walk away with it. But also, as I look at the stats, you look at the field goals. Uh, we took 57 field goals. UK took 72. So 57 minus 72, that's 15. So what you're doing is you're starting the game with giving them 15 shots. Mm-hmm. That's never a good thing. And you talked about the rebounding discrepancy in this game. They had 18 offensive Unbelievable. rebounds. Unbelievable. We yeah. had six. And so you think about where they get those 15 extra shots. It's from the offensive mm-hmm. rebounding. And also when I've seen us match up, uh, to some of these teams this year, we are. It seems to me like we are a smaller team, and mm-hmm. rebounding has been an issue. And so we've got to correct the rebounds. Uh, we've got to make sure that we close out defensive possessions with the rebound. You, you're not done playing defense until you get the ball off a rebound or a turnover or whatever. And that's always been, I think, this team's Achilles' heels. This year is if they show up and they play defense and they control the boards, they're going to win. Okay, Mm -hmm. I think we have guys who can score. We have veteran players. But if they control the boards, they dominate the boards, and they play defense, they win. And I know Armando didn't have his best game and he was in a little bit of foul trouble. I think if he makes a commitment to running and rim runs like he Mm -hmm. has in certain games, I think that's going to put a lot of stress on the other big. And I think that's going to really – uh, allow him to get some easy buckets and get his confidence to get him going. When he's having a hard night of scoring or he's getting double teamed, it just seems like every, the defense is collapsing on him. I think if he makes a concerted effort to running the court and get some easy buckets, I think that's going to work wonders for him. But uh, that's just what I saw based off of what you said. And I looked at the stats and I was like, this is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that was a big... You know, and again, some of those late is like, dude, the ball just never seems to find our hands. And it's like, I don't, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, basketball mind, but it's just sometimes I watch games and I'm like, okay, they airball the three and it just lands right in the dude's like had no choice but to rebound it. Um, but you know, again, it's, I, I think, look, if we were, if we were seven and three with loss to, you know, Shamanad you know, or something like that. I mean, fine, but at least we've lost three games. I mean, this is this is you know, looking at the bright side. Has glass full, <laughs> glass half full. Uh, I think my glass is half has glasses half empty. Um, you know what I mean? It's just it's just that's kind of how you have to be here. And so going into the Oklahoma game, that's a Jumpman Classic. That's in Charlotte. That's on Wednesday, nine p.m. Um, Oklahoma is a team. They're ten and zero. Uh, we were picked to be, you know, toward the bottom of the Big 12 because they sucked last year. Um, but they have played um, decidedly better this year, I think, than most people expected. But they haven't really beaten anybody. Um, I'm trying to pull up my my notes here. They beat Arkansas, who we beat. Arkansas was project was at the time was the 14th team in the country. I think Arkansas was maybe a little overrated. But no real notable wins. Um, you know, I, I still think at this stage of the season, you got to say that Oklahoma's kind of like exceeded expectations. Um, they added six guys in the transfer portal. You know, when I was doing a little uh, background on that, it really seemed like what their strategy was, was, hey, let me go get great players from lesser known conferences. Yeah. Right. And so, so that seems to be what their roster's filled with. They've got a couple guards that are really good. They got this kid, uh, I hope I'm saying this right. A Y A O W E H. Kids averaging 15, shooting 67%. He's the leading scorer on the team, shooting 67%, 75% from three. So, like, and he's a two way. I mean, he's two and a half steals a game. I mean, he seems like a great player. So, he's the guy that I'm looking at. And I'm like, all right, this dude's probably going to go for 30. 
right? <laughs> like you got to just, uh-huh. you just got to assume that against us, somebody's going to have that happen. They had another kid that was a, that was a fringe draft pick. Um, Uzon. I hope I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, he's a don't make it easy. Uh, yeah. Uzon, yeah. He's yeah. a, he, he had a good freshman year, but he's one of those guys that he's playing well this year, but he hasn't played to what a lot of people exactly. have thought he would be. A little more but of a pass first guy too. Yeah. I mean, they got they got you know. Look, it looks like statistically they have a <clears throat> really balanced roster, mm-hmm. and you know, um, but I don't think they're necessarily all that deep. And in my opinion, like I said a few minutes ago, like I think this is a team you should beat. They're top ten, but look, we were set. We were coming into the week, we were ranked nine at seven and two. They're ranked like eleven at ten and zero, oh. and I think this says yeah. a lot. You were talking before we got started about their strength of schedule. Yeah, you know, they should have just played their club basketball team instead of some of these teams. I mean, they just beat Green Bay. Uh, I mean, Not the, the only team in Green Bay that I know of is, yeah, the Packers. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, they are on a little bit of a rebuild, Oklahoma. Uh, they, you know, I think, uh, what is his name, uh, Porter Mosers. Mm-hmm. Porter Moser, He's uh, he came from Chicago Loyola. He was the head coach of that team that made that long run, almost made it to the Final Four, if they did make the Final Four. Uh, but their strength of schedule has just been – it should be criminal uh, how easy of a schedule they had. And also, I think that if we had this schedule, we'd be undefeated as yeah. well right now. Uh, they have beat Providence, that's notable, and they've also beat Arkansas, which we have to, as well, um, as have as have we. Um, but uh, I think this will be a good game and also be a good test for Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. It'll be a good test to see what they're about and against a quality opponent like us. I think we are a quality team. Uh, we lost, like you said, to UConn. Uh, then we just lost to Kentucky. Bellanova, you can make some excuses and say we should have won that game. Probably should have. Mm-hmm. UConn, there's no team that plays as hard as UConn. I just saw them just just fly across the country and just destroy Gonzaga the other day. Uh, but, no, I, hey, I'm looking forward to this. Also, we're get, this is a neutral court, but, you know, we should have some type of home atmosphere right there oh, in yeah. Charlotte. This is in Charlotte, and, yep. Yeah, I want to see what the Jordan Classic is about. You know, anything that Jordan's involved with or he could possibly be at as a Carolina fan, That's, I mean, that's going to be pretty cool. And I'm sitting here thinking, Sleep Dog, are you going to the game? Dude, <clears throat> if I found out Michael Jordan was going to be there, I would probably just, no matter what I was doing, I would go. Um, and for those of you there, as I don't know, I've always told Tyler this. I said, hey, man, look, I'll never take advantage of our friendship except for under one condition, and that's if you ever find out Michael Jordan's going to be somewhere and you can make sure I'm there uh, and you don't do that, um, I'm not going to be happy with you. But, yeah I, yeah, I don't know. I'm not planning on it yet, but it would be a good game. And, Why don't uh, we just get in the car and go? Let's go. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in, dude. Right, I mean, I've I'm, been I'm thinking totally about go. this. What time is the game? It's 9 p.m., buddy. We can drink coffee all Good the way there. God, <laughs> dude, we're we gonna can't get come home the same on, night. Yeah, we're gonna get back on Thursday. Christmas. Yeah, I mean, we won't be back till Christmas. <laughs> Good but, God, I mean, I saw Man, that somebody should be arrested for these starting times. Jesus Christ! I'm telling Christ. you guys. God bless, guys. Listen, Golly. Sleep Dog's uh, about to be a father, and my biggest fear it strikes fear. Here's the thing. All right, this is God's honest truth. You guys can see what's going on behind me. It's like chaos. I'm turning my my life into a nursery. And, uh, you know, this is my office, right? And I'm like, you guys know me going off on this Jonathan Kaminga shit. And I get that a lot of people, you guys don't know, like, who the hell he is. You will, I promise. But, like, you don't yet. And here's my famous move, okay? The Warriors play at 10 o'clock every damn night because they're West Coast. And some nights they just really just twist the knife and play at 1030. Like, that, I, that's an insult to me, right? And the funniest thing is, dude, I'm like a kid. That just won't go to sleep. You know, I'm just holding out. I just want to stay awake. And, dude, I will stay up. I will see. I have NBA League Pass. And I love watching the in-arena thing. Because, dude, you see the national anthem. You see the starting lineups. I'm like, dude, I'm there. I'm at the game right now. And as soon as they roll them some bitches out and, and tip, it's the last thing I remember. Every single time. I bet I have watched. I have watched. I mean, just like the the Wizards play the the Celtics until like just trying to keep myself awake for this tip. And every time dude, I make it and that's it. And I got to wake up and check the box score. And so when Carolina plays at nine, which they've done several times already middle of the week, 
I'm like, holy shit, man. Like, so yeah, we could get in the car. Good news is you get a full day's work in, man. Get in the car, drive three hours to Charlotte, and I mean, grab you some popcorn on the way to your seat, dude. And you sit down right about the time that shit starts. Because this is the other thing. It's a jump man. So they say it's going to start at nine, but they're going to play this other game probably beforehand. I don't know if there's another game there. Is there? Got it. Oh, hell. And so they'll play oh. another game. That game will go to double overtime. You know, it'll be a 1047 tip. And I'll just be in there <laughs> looking like I just got hit with uh like I just got hit with uh you know a little morphine over there. <laughs> Dude, the problem is is if I get ticket sleep and you know my you know me and you, like we just put a huge emphasis on sleep. There's just nothing better mm. than waking up feeling refreshed. I mean, they don't call me a wake dog. Sleep. Yeah, and if the I will get my tickets through the basketball program. And their pet peeve is if you leave early, boy, they are upset. Yeah, and yeah. you know they have these nine o'clock tips, and they expect everybody to stay until the ball mm. is just. Yeah, I know the care if they have a forty point lead with two minutes. Yeah, left, you better stay. You better stay and, through uh, those uh, like, Toyota thons, December sales <laughs> to remember event, Lexus commercials. Like, all right, dude, guys, come on, wrap it up. We're up twenty. We're down yeah, twenty. No. Whatever, I need to it doesn't maintain matter. Yeah, my mental, my physical, mental, and emotional health. Yeah. Uh, relies on me getting good quality sleep, and you can expect me to stay in these seats God. at eleven thirty at night to bear through a thirty point lead with one minute and thirty seconds left. That's, Guys, that's if you go, thing, sleep. if we go, <laughs> just look for me. I'll be in there REM sleep about you know seven fifty <laughs> to go in the second period or second half, and just over there. You know, I don't. I'm in. I mean, I'll I'll go. Um, I'll stay in the seat. You might have somebody, some old usher, be shaking me in the leg. Like, Sir, <laughs> game's been over for half an hour. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, it's bad. You guys got a cotton here anywhere? Yeah, dude. I mean, these late ones are tough. But uh, yeah, so I don't know. I think I think you know this Oklahoma game is weird, man. Like tough stretch, close loss at Villanova. Better team, better time. UConn, not probably. I mean, probably not our best game, but not our worst. I think we definitely, definitely did not play our best game against Kentucky, and still found that that was the one takeaway to to sort of get off of this and, and move on. Mm-hmm. But the one very very positive takeaway I had was you mentioned it. Never really felt like we were out of it, but it also never. It was one of those games that never really felt like we were going to break through. Mm-hmm. But yet we hung around. We got down 12. We come back. We got down heavy again, like seven or eight, which seemed like 15 in that game. Came back again. And like good teams are going to find a way to win those games where you just don't have it. And and I mean, ball bounces our way a couple times, and I, I think we got a chance at doing that. So um, look, man, looking at the bright side, being a homer, whatever you want to call it, Like, but now we get to turn the corner. You get to play a team that on paper – looks great now i think at the end of the year they're not going to look great um win and move on you know what i mean yeah. <laughs> i mean in oklahoma by the way they're gonna be dude no, oklahoma's yeah, i gonna know lose, what you meant oklahoma's no. gonna lose 10 games it just like listen <laughs> once they start big big 12 conference play God, oklahoma yeah. we ain't gonna be talking about oklahoma this is a black know? friday they are at black <laughs> friday tv is what they are you're gonna get yeah, them some bitches uh, home you're gonna plug them in and realize you got the popeyes menu on that some bitch like i'm and, telling you uh, they're not good we just realized i'll probably win the national championship after this episode <laughs> uh but uh, I just, uh beat us by dog. 30 Listen, is this a must win for us? Do you do you think would you do you like must win? I hate the saying this must wins because if we lose this game, what's this mean? We don't show up for the next one. Uh I, I mean it feels like this this Oklahoma game to me feels like it's going to be okay, what are we about? Okay, we just had a tough loss. Things aren't going our way. We got some bad press. We didn't really execute down the stretch. Are we going to get back in the gym? We're going to have some tough practices, and now we're going to come out and kick Oklahoma's ass. Truth that would is, be my, my mentality approaching yep. this game. We made some mistakes, so mm-hmm. what? Get over it. Okay, come back out here. Leave it in the rear view. We'll execute. We'll learn from it. And we'll go out here, and we'll kick Oklahoma's ass. That's, that's what I'm talking about, and that's what I want to see from this team. That's what I want to see, too. The question is, is it a, a must-win? I say absolutely not, and here's why. Um, I feel like must-win games are when you got questions about who you really are on a 
different, you know, look, we, we, we said ourselves like, Hey, we're going to find out who this team is at the end of this stretch. Right. Yeah. I think if we had gotten beat badly in any of these games, you're starting to wonder like, man, maybe we just don't have it. And, and, and I think I'll be honest as a fan, I kind of let that thought creep in a little bit. I'm like, are we just on the fringe? Are we just a 15 to 25 type team that's, you know, might, might, might make a run to sweet 16 and we just ain't upper echelon. And, and, and that could very well be true. And I think 99% of schools really want that. <laughs> you know, they, they consider that a good season, but I just haven't seen enough yet to make me feel like we're definitely not that team. Okay. Um, I felt, I felt like I was getting there <laughs> early yeah. in that Kentucky game. We kept, you know, coming back. So the reason I feel like it's not a must win, for example, if we lose to Oklahoma at all, because I feel like we're a much better team. If we lose to Oklahoma, then I think maybe we start asking that question. If we, yep. if we had lost to Kentucky by, you know, 15 or 20, I'd be really wondering, um, how we bounce back if we were to, to go out and not look good again. I mean, that's three losses in a row. I mean, the next game, like, what is that Florida state? Like, I mean, that becomes, in my opinion, like you got to start winning at some point. Um, but yeah. And, and then you also, I mean, I hate to say this, but look what happened to us last year. We were, well, yeah, I think rightfully not, not in the tournament. We did not play well, but you started getting down toward the end of the season and you didn't have any anything to fall back on. You know, you had a bunch of losses. You didn't have these quad ones. We talked about how much we don't like it. It's the way the system works, but you got to beat somebody. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think it's a must win. I think it's a should win. Um, and if you lose a should win game, must win games follow at some point. Yeah, uh, well... I don't ever classify any game as a must win, but I think for me, this game is very important because I think it mm -hmm. could be a, a a foresight to see what this team is really about. And mm -hmm. the reason I say that is because they didn't execute, like I just said, and also they've taken some losses lately to some good quality mm -hmm. teams. I want to see how they come out against Oklahoma because I think good teams have this mentality of being able to regroup and then fix their problems and move forward. Mm -hmm. And last year I felt like some out no outside noise really got into the locker room and messed mm -hmm. up the chemistry. And now there's a little bit of these naysayers or you're taking a little heat from the outside. I want to see this team stay together and then really regroup and come out and kick Oklahoma's ass. And if they do that, I'm a, I'm I'm buying it as like, hey, this could be a team that could make a little run come March. And that would make me more of a believer. Mm -hmm. Now, if they come out and they just find a way to win, I think it okay, that I would take that, but also I want this team to come out and make a statement and mm -hmm. have like a just a blowout ass kicking because that's yeah. what good teams do in my opinion. Yeah. And I honestly, you know, I'll put I mean, I'll put rubber on the road. I think they beat the hell out of Oklahoma. I think that's what you're going to see. I think they're going to show up. I think they're going to shoot well. I think they're going to rebound. I think they're not going to turn the ball over. I think they're going to do a lot of the other things um, that they didn't do so well yesterday, uh, Saturday. And uh, I, I personally think that's what you're going to see. That's the general feel I have for the team. And if it yeah. turns out a different way, then I guess we'll be talking about that a week from now. Yeah. Um, something that everybody's been talking about all week. We don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but – you know, the Draymond Green situation is interesting to me. And actually, at first, I was going to go through the Draymond suspension and because it's kind of unprecedented. Like, he's got this yeah. sort of – and you you were the same draft class as Draymond or the year before? Uh, no, uh, I was before Dre. I'm not right. sure if it was one or two years. Okay. Yeah. So th so there's that element. And, you know, Draymond has, is well-known. People kind of love him or hate him. He's seen as a real catalyst for his team. Um, <clears throat> but I guess more – um, more recently, you know, obviously there's been a lot said about it. I, for what it's worth, uh, if you guys didn't see this, you know, he's flailing around, said he was trying to sell a foul, hits dude in the side of the head, Jers uh, Yusef Nurkic, Nurkic, or what I can't even pronounce his name, uh, from the Suns, dude's like seven feet tall, goes to the ground, um, you know, and they suspend Draymond indefinitely. And the narrative has been like, you know, he needs help. Which, yeah. you know, it just seems to me 
that he's on a team that's not playing well, and probably everybody's pissed off and frustrated. I even talk about stuff getting in the locker room. I feel like there's something going on there. I yeah. watch a lot of Warriors games. But then the, the real reason this came up to me, um, and we don't have to spend a ton of time on it, it was like they're dragging Draymond through the mud. <clears throat> and then last night at this MMA, at UFC fight, these two dudes like, and I get that UFC is a different thing, right? It's like, it's yeah. all about fighting. And that's like, people love that shit. We just love watching people argue and hate each other. And ultimately, <laughs> we just really get satisfaction, I guess, when they actually follow through and beat the shit out of each other. <laughs> well, these guys just go into it in the stands. And yeah. it was like a women and children. Never mind why there are children there. I don't. I didn't really understand that part uh, at all as an upcoming parent. But like, you know, the narrative is totally different. Like nobody's no. asking if these guys are off their rocker. Maybe we just have clearly accepted. Like clearly they're off their rocker. They're UFC fighters. But uh, you know, I don't know, man. And I don't know if best way to blend this together. But you know, you've got this whole thing surrounding Draymond. You came into the NBA right after the malice at the palace. You know what I mean? And like all that sort of stuff, like anytime there are like these types of altercations in other sports, it's a big issue. And then that thing last night, uh, nobody seems to talk about it. And it's it's just weird to me. I'm like, I don't understand. Like everybody thinks it's cool. I'm just like, dude, this is just stupid. Well, Sleep Dog, you know what I think is stupid? I think it's stupid is the NBA is trying to be a mental health expert right mm -hmm. here. Okay, and I get it. You, you got to look out for your players, but that's not their job. And this whole indefinitely thing, just go ahead and suspend them. Hit them with yeah. 25 games. Hit them with yeah. 20 games, okay? The five games didn't work, okay? I, I think it's just, you know, it's it's kind of gotten kind of like where, oh, I feel so sad for Draymond. You know what? He took a swing at somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, luckily – Nurchic didn't even get hurt all that bad. He just kind of fell down, got hit in the neck. What if it would have been a closed fist that popped him right in the face, broke his nose, or mm -hmm. something like that? Then we might be talking about like, ooh, Draymond should have got 25, 30 games. But to act like the NBA hasn't let Draymond kind of get away with some of these incidents that he goes with, like kicking people in the nuts, like, I mean, in the finals, stepping on people, flailing. I mean, he hasn't taken the five-game suspension seriously uh, last mm -hmm. time he got suspended. Hit him with 25 games. I think this, like, kind of leave it up in the air. and This sad story about, like, hey, Draymond needs to get help. Like, what can we do to help you? I, I think that's a bunch. I don't, I'm not buying it. I'm just not buying it. That's not the NBA's job, by the way. And the one thing I know is, if somebody needs to get help, it's not going to be because the NBA wants them to get help. It's not going to be because Golden State wants them to get help. It's going to be that Draymond wants to change and mm -hmm. he sees something wrong internally and he needs to fix it. That The help can't come from anybody except for Draymond, and that's not the J NBA's job. So if I were the commissioner, it would be 25 games immediately. Yeah. I'd just be like, okay, your repeated action, it's not necessarily one incident. It's not this incident that got you the 25 games. It's your repeated and mm -hmm. also your history of not taking us seriously. And also, 25 games to me is kind of on the low end of what a lot of people are just talking about. Yeah. Some people, somebody told me in the media, he should be kicked out of the league. And I oh. thought that was a little bit extreme. Yeah. I think that was a little bit of extreme, but I don't think it's too extreme for some people to say 50 games. There was I mean, a, there was a, there were some, you know, sources, air quotes about, uh, you know, the season. <clears throat> and I think, yeah. you know, look, the NBA is, is, is very, trying very hard to sell itself internationally, trying to clean up its brand. You know, you got this John Moran thing. Dra look, here's the problem with, with Draymond. The whole thing with Rudy Gobert, which just happened, I can see in some ways, cause you're like, dude, there's look, he overreacted. I think if you slow everything down and look at it in hindsight, it wasn't a good move. But in the moment, he's protecting his guy. And was he like, could Rudy Gobert have gotten seriously injured? I didn't think so. Right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um, you know, the Nurchich thing is just like, you know, but it is, you're right. And I like Draymond. I've said this a bunch of times on the pod. Like I used to really not like Draymond. Now I really do like Draymond. But even I'm like, dude, come on, bro. Like, 
Um, yeah. And, you know, I think that uh, I'm with you on, on that. Um, I think that the indefinitely thing, my standpoint from the league is like, it's kind of a cop out. You know what I mean? I think mm-hmm. they met together and they felt like, hey, if we say indefinitely and we create this narrative, it's like we're doing something positive when we're dodging the bullet of suspending a guy that matters on a team that everybody loves, a player that's polarizing, yes, but also very well liked in a lot of circles. And I think to your point, they should have, you know, they should have taken a firm stand. And honestly, dude, I thought at the end of the day they'd come down on him like 15 or 20, which is a huge suspension. Um, and, you know, basically they're like absolving themselves of any sort of governing responsibility and putting it on Draymond based on saying it definitely means you tell us when you want to come back. Well, I'll go do all that shit as fast as possible. I'd be like, well, one game sounds good. Um, you know, so uh, <clears throat> Brock Purdy's in the tent, by the way, of course. That um, fucker. <laughs> Sorry, guys. He's my starting quarterback. Here we God, got we old, my mom's old uh, back, back, uh, <laughs> Christian McCaffrey's over there getting his knee taped up. Uh, Sleep Dogs fantasy season is unraveling quick. Who is there? Mc- oh, that's McCaffrey. Oh, McCaffrey's back on the field. Who's number 14? Their backup quarterback is uh, is that Nick Mullins? No, it's Sam Darnold. Oh, God. Anyway, look Sam concussed. Really bad. Look like a concussion situation. Um, anyway. Well, by, by the time this comes on, I'm sure the whole world will be talking about that. So anyway, um, interesting thing, but I just thought it was interesting that, you know, there's so much to talk about that. These MMA meatheads are just beating the shit out of each other in the stands. And it's like, dude, look, I'm, I'm not a UFC guy, but I'm not anti. If, 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 those, if those big fights come on. I'll watch them. I'm not buying them. I'm not one of those guys that know. I don't have any idea who any of these guys were. No idea. You could you could point a gun to my head and ask me to name one of them. I couldn't. I honestly couldn't tell you. But it's not like I'm anti the sport. I just I just think it's absurd. Like, bro, you guys are grown ass men going to fight each other in the stands, and it's all seems so put together. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Well, better question is, would you take a shot from one of them, like for a million bucks? Absolutely. Uh, the light heavyweight, <laughs> I'd get in there and throw down with them. Uh, oh, sleep. Shit. So, Beat the hell out of me. <laughs> sorry. I, I just dodged your whole question. Uh, I totally mm. forgot about the MMA stuff. I kind of forgot, too. Yeah, and so, uh, <laughs> back to the Brock MMA. Brock Purdy's back, MMA. baby. All right, let's go. I need him back Brock out and there. Roll. I don't care God, if he's not going to make it. To, We're going to get to Brock in a second, but go ahead. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> all right, listen. The reason why... I think the MMA needs to be a little bit, a little bit careful on this because they could be turning into the WWF, and mm-hmm. we all know that some of this stuff is is staged because mm-hmm. us as like fans or people who watch it, they really buy into it. It really helps build the fight. But also, there's nothing wrong with having a little bit of class. And I will say, Sean Strickland, the guy who got in the fight, I don't know who the other guy is he's fighting. They're trying to build up a fight. But um, he is kind of a loose cannon. He's always been a loose cannon, like probably a lot of these guys. But, you know, as the sport grows, I mm-hmm. don't think it's a smart decision for these fighters to be out on the street and fighting each other because, first of all, you could have an injury and – I'm pretty sure that, uh, you know, that injury wouldn't be classified as something that, hey, you know what, you got injured on your own terms. I'm mm-hmm. not sure if the UFC would pick up that one. Uh, but also, why would you risk, you know, like prevent yourself from having another big fight, and making a lot of money as, you know, an athlete? That's what you do for a living. That's what people pay to watch you fight. Why would you do it for free in the stands? Mm -hmm. And it just makes no sense to me. It's like bad business. It's like, you know, you are paid to do a certain job and people want to come watch you do that. Why would you ever do it for free in the stands and risk getting hurt? And that's my first thought. And that has no connection to the Draymond thing. That's just what I think about this whole MMA fight stuff and the fans. Well, and I think the reality of it is, and I'll close on this and then we'll move on. But like the reality of it is, is the UFC has always, has always in my mind, MMA, whatever it is, sort of teetered the line between reality TV and boxing. 
in terms of entertainment value, yeah. right? There's the boxing is dead and it's been dead and Jake Paul, notwithstanding, you know, um, it, it's going to stay dead. So the UFC definitely has like actual fights that are entertaining, but you know, there's this whole sort of dialogue that like, you know, appeals to most of America, at least like of this whole Kardashian sort of situation where, you know, everybody's it's just drama. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, um, it's like that, you know, I get it by creating this drama and these guys, oh, they really don't like each other. Okay, fine. But like, you know, Tyson Holyfield and all these like big, you know, Muhammad Ali fights you date all the way back. Like that stuff is contained, right? It's contained yep. in the narrative. And, um, you know, I just feel like, you know, with social media and these guys are, there's a lot of people, a lot of young people that, that follow that. And, and look, dude, I'm not trying to be all, I mean, I guess I'm getting old. It's, look, I'm an adult. I don't know how to do what these guys say, but they have an impact on a lot of people. And it's just, I don't know. The, the sport is, um, in my opinion, should lean more on the value of the athletes and, and of the product than trying to create the, all these fucking narratives, dude. It's just like exhausting. These guys just fucking. Anyway, so who knows? I don't know who these guys are. They fight January 20th. I did learn that. I did learn. I know when they fight. I know one of their names, right? So, I mean, maybe that's the point. Anyway, our first segment, guys, is really we we got our we went to our marketing team and we were like, "What do we call this?" Uh, Marketing team came back and said, "We're going to call this contender or pretender." I'm pretty sure this has probably been done a million different times, but it's pretty good. So we're going to go through the NBA, we're going to go through the NFL, we're going to go through NCAA, and Big Hawk. I'm going to name a team, and you're going to tell me whether a contender. Or bring it on. Bring it on. I just had some some uh, pre-workout, so that's why oh, I'm yeah. standing for this episode, guys. Guys, I'm three beers deep. Uh, NBA, Los Angeles Clippers. Pretender. And the reason I say that, um, I think they have a lot of older guys. Uh, I think James Harden still has a lot to prove uh, that he can take lesser of a role, and I think he has to take lesser of a role for a team to really – uh, make a deep tournament or a deep uh, run in the playoffs, especially at the NBA level. Number six in the Western Conference right now, 15 and 10 overall, seven straight. A lot of narrative going around about that. Contender, pretender. Big Hawk says that Clippers are a pretender, and I think I agree. Uh, all right, here's a good one <clears throat> Houston Rockets. They're seventh, one spot behind the Clippers. They're 13 and nine overall, 11 and one at home, and they've won five in a row. Houston Rockets. Pretender, this is just easy money, easy. They just absolutely suck last year. You don't make a 360 and actually contend for the championship unless you get a LeBron James or somebody like that in their prime. Total pretender, uh, it's a sign of a young team to be very good at home and just be atrocious on the road. They're not old enough. They don't have enough vets either. All right. Phoenix Suns, number 10. These are the opposites, right? These guys are seem to be on the downside. They're 10 in the Western Conference, 13 and 12 overall, four and six in their last 10. And Bradley Beal's out again. Their big threes played 24 minutes together, I think, this year. Phoenix Suns. Sleep dog. The Phoenix Suns are an absolute contender. And the reason I say that is because they have one of the best players to ever play the game in Kevin Durant, and they also have a sniper in Devin Booker. And also, once Bradley Beal gets healthy, sniper. And I know that my old coach, Frank Vogel, is a defensive savant, and he's going to have these guys. They're not even going to want to play offense anymore. Everyone talks about there's not going to be enough enough ball for – all the Phoenix Suns, they're not going to want to shoot the ball. All they're going to want to do is play defense because Vogel is going to ingrain that in them, and they are an absolute contender. I picked them to win the whole thing before the season. I'm not abandoning them right now. They are a contender. Love it. Last one in the NBA, Golden State Warriors, number 11, one spot behind the Phoenix Suns, 11 in the Western Conference, 11 and 14 overall, four and six also in the last 10, and in general just total chaos. Okay, now this is a tough one. They are a contender. And the reason they are a contender is because Steph Curry, they have veterans. They have uh, my guy, CP. He's old. He might be ancient, but listen, he is a got a big bald spot coming in, by the way. I noticed that last night. Who? 
Chris Paul's oh, Chris guy. Paul? I mean, he's already bald, but like he's like real bald in one spot. <laughs> That's what happens when bald you go in that lie. type of environment. Yeah. Listen, he's going to get traded to a good situation, probably to South Beach, and that bald spot uh, won't even be recognizable anymore. Uh, but the Golden State Warriors are an absolute contender. <clears throat> they have championship pedigree, and also they have a – all star sitting on the bench, and his name is Jonathan Kaminga. Okay, oh, damn right. He is a thoroughbred waiting to be released into the <laughs> wild. Listen, Draymond is suspended. They're going to be saying Draymond, who once Kaminga gets his confidence and his minutes that he deserves, Kerr, stop playing. Put the guy in the game. Let him get his confidence. Get, let him run. Let him play. And then he's going to break out, be an all star caliber player. And the Golden State Warriors are not going to lose a game. Their trajectory is just going to go. Go up, 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 and they are a contender. <laughs> Love it. I agree. JK's now in the starting lineup. Still not getting the minutes he deserves, but he will. And when he does, everybody's going to know why Sleep Dog's so high on him. Moving on to the NFL, Indianapolis Colts didn't do as much note taking on like records and things like that, but they just beat the Steelers on Thursday night. They were eight and six, very much in a playoff hunt with Minshew Mania. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, you don't even have to finish it. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and answer it right now. The Indianapolis Colts. <laughs> Colts. The Indianapolis the Colts. <laughs> Listen, guys, they are a pretender. And the reason they're pretenders is because their best player is on the bench. Jonathan Taylor's not even healthy, has been in and out the whole year, came in midseason. They had a contract dispute. Uh, they can't get that right. Their number one draft picks, Dunsky, for the whole year. They wouldn't have shut him down so quickly if they're actually a contender. Uh, Minshew's good. He's not good enough to lead a team to a Super Bowl. They are a pretender. They'll be bouncing the first round. You don't build a record or a reputation off beating the Steelers this year either. Owner sucks too. By the way, guys, if you guys aren't, if you listen to this as a podcast, do yourself a favor and just at least watch this segment on YouTube, guys, and subscribe to our channel while you're there. Next team, Buffalo Bills. Buffalo Bills are a contender. And the reason I say that is you That's can never count That's a change for them you, out. I think. Yes. You cannot count them out, okay? Josh Allen's taking a lot of heat, okay? This is what the stars do. They take the heat from the outside. They stay internal, and they just throw frozen ropes all through uh, the season, regardless of what people say. Um, I think they're going to make a deep tournament run, or <laughs> I think they're going to make a deep playoff run. Uh, I believe in Josh Allen. They have some talent. And I feel like this team has to win now. And I think there's an emphasis on this team to win now or they're going to break it up. So I, I would think they're a contender. Guys, we are uh, recording as they're playing um, at home against Dallas right now. Buffalo 7-6. and six. They're up 14-3 on the Cowboys. So, uh, yeah. I mean, that one obviously will, uh, will tell more of the tale when we're off of here. But last NFL um, no, I'm sorry. Actually, next one is uh, Dallas Cowboys, contender, pretender. The Dallas Cowboys are an absolute pretender. And the reason I say that is because the Dak Prescott has never done it for me. I don't think he's a Super Bowl quarterback. He's – and I think Cam Newton actually said it. He is a game manager. You have to surround him with the perfect pieces to win. And when they lost their one player, I don't know who the hell it is, but he is a very important piece. Everyone said it on all the talk shows. Uh, it wasn't Trayvon Diggs. Oh, it was uh, the defensive guy. Yeah. It was Trayvon guy. Diggs. It was Trayvon it Diggs. It was Trayvon Diggs? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. When they lost him, they became an absolute pretender. Yeah. It was him. Um, yep. Or was it Micah Parsons? I think it was, nope, Trayvon it, Diggs. It, was, it was Trayvon Diggs. It was a Diggs. Yep. All right. Speaking of game manager, last one in the NFL, not a team, but a player. Brock Purdy, contender, pretender. Who's back in the game, by the way? Elite. System elite quarterback, period. Uh, listen, this guy is possibly on the <laughs> the best contract to ever given, ever be given in for an NFL team, this guy is basically making minimum wage and playing on a contender. And you guys know what I think about the Niners. They're probably getting destroyed by Arizona right now because I'm not watching. No, they're uh, winning. Okay, good. Um, I believe in Brock Purdy. I don't think he makes a lot of mistakes. Uh, to me, I wouldn't put him in the category of like a Peyton Manning 
or Aaron Rodgers, but I would put him like the tier below that. I don't think like there's a big difference between him and let's just say Lamar Jackson. Mm-hmm. Like I think Lamar Jackson does it a different way and impacts the football game from like, hey, this dude is he can run, he can throw. But I think Purdy's really smart. I don't think he's gonna beat himself. So I think that makes him highly effective. That's why he's elite in my category. I think he's elite, man. I think he just puts the ball on the money a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And and listen, he gets blamed because the team mm-hmm. around him is great, and that's uh, not his fault. All right, moving on. We're going to finish on this NCAA basketball. First up, Clemson Tigers. Clemson t- Tigers. Okay. Oh, boy. Clemson Tigers. <laughs> Pretender. They may win the <laughs> ACC, okay, but they are not a contender to win the whole thing. But I will say, Clemson is a tough team, and you can't take them lightly. Arguably, they have the <laughs> they have the best big man right now. It's playing the best in the ACC, and that's PJ Hall. PJ Hall has been lighting it up. Very di- very dynamic player. Very actually, he's he's great to watch. You should go check him out. He's doing a lot of big things, but. They also have a lot of pieces uh, in Shefflin, who's a, a great rebounder. A lot of people have compared him to a baby Barkley in a Clemson jersey. Um, but they have some athletes too, so they they're a top. They are a top fifteen ish team right now, but to me, they are not a contender. I, I I really think in college basketball. No, I'll say this at the end. I don't want to give away. Didn't they just lose? They just lost. Who'd they lose to? They were because they oh they lost to Memphis yeah they were they were yeah. undefeated and moved they jumped way up after uh, maybe it was a win at TCU or something they jumped up eleven spots and were way up in the thirteenth um, and uh, yeah just lost they were ahead of Kentucky and um, then they lost to Memphis so Memphis is not top twenty five team so yeah solid right. team though they're they're top fifty team next up Arizona Wildcats. After coming off a loss against Purdue, where Purdue looked great, thought about asking you Purdue, but that was too much of a layup. Arizona Wildcats. They're a contender. I think there's they have this big kid named Balo who can – he's arguably one of the top five big men in college right now. Uh, Arizona's also deep. They run. They play really well. Tommy Lloyd is their head coach. He's they've won a lot of a lot of games and also they got bounced in the first round last year in the tournament. It seems like that's kind of motivated him and the team. Uh, I will say this right now. Caleb loves playing about as good as he's ever played. Outstanding. He's, yeah, he's getting a lot of assists. He's playing tough. He's shooting a high field goal percentage. Um, it's really good to see him doing that. And uh, yeah, I actually think they're a contender. They could win it all. Kentucky Wildcats. Uh, I would say, <laughs> I know I built them up in the segment, but the Kentucky Wildcats are an absolute pretender. They're not old <laughs> enough. They don't have enough veterans. Okay. They've been up and down. They lost to UNCW in the perfect setting at home at Rupp. You're supposed to win those games. That is a setup game for you just to walk out there and just destroy a team. Okay. It's the middle of finals. They scheduled them for a reason and you drop it. Okay. Contenders don't do that. And you know, Cal's taking a lot of heat. He's done some good things, but you know, this team could be a sweet sixteen sweet sixteen team, but I don't see him going to the lead eight. Last one. I mean, had to see this one coming. Ray Charles could see this one coming. The North Carolina Tar Heels. Tar Heels. <laughs> I can print it. I will say a contender, okay? And the reason I'm gonna say that, okay, and is because we're a veteran team, okay? We have a lot of veterans. We had a tough year last year. That's going to be used as motivation. But also, it seems like these guys have better chemistry. They're finding themselves out as the season goes on. And I do think this team will only get better the more they play with each other, okay? Mm -hmm. And I will say, you know, Hubert has taken a lot of heat for not playing the bench much. And also not playing freshman. A lot of that's been a knock that a lot of people have said, but he has given Cadeau a lot of minutes. And I think as the season goes on, I think Cadeau's going to keep playing better and better. 
And I like what RJ is doing. RJ is probably one of the most explosive scores in the country this year. Mm-hmm. And I think he's actually going to keep getting better and better. He's going to have a great year. And I think Baycott's going to figure it out. He's too much of a veteran player and he's too good not to. So uh, I think we're a contender. And also Harrison Ingram, he's been playing unbelievable. There you have it, folks. And I read on the internet before we came on, so it has to be true. Since 2004, the national champion has been in the top 12 in week six of the AP poll every year since 2004. We ain't going to be there week seven, but we were there week six, and that's all that matters. Interesting tidbit. No idea if it's true, but it sure seemed like it. We were on the list. Kentucky was not, so I mean that validates it. Neither was Duke. Neither was Duke. I definitely noticed that. Um, so anyway, I mean, guys, what a segment. What a segment. That was great. And if you, uh, I'm going to tell you again, if you just listen to that on the pod, you didn't get the full experience. I'm not even going to tell you why. You just got to go to a YouTube channel. You got to subscribe to it. You got to like it. You got to share it. You got to tell people about it. You got to go buy a t shirt. I mean, holy mm-hmm. shit, guys, you're running out of time. Great I tell you choice. what, here's my commitment to Sleep Hog Nation. Today's Monday, as you're listening to this, you go buy a t shirt. I'll have it out the door on Tuesday. I'm going to do my damn to get it to you by Christmas time. All right. I mean, this is the Christmas Christmas gift of 2023. Uh, also, I mean, how about this? If you live in the Triangle area, we will hand deliver it. To I will you. hand deliver it. We'll we'll pick one random shirt. Me and Sleep Dog bring it right to your front. Right porch. to you. Right to your front door. Probably the random pick is probably going to be the closest one, easiest for us to get to. I might want um, to. Yeah. <laughs> no sleep. <laughs> uh, sleep dogs are starting to just, you know, when time to do the laundry, I'm just digging through. Oh, well, sleep punk shirt be all right. Um, yeah, guys, there's, I mean, good gracious. You could sleep in this thing. You could wear it to work. You could wear it to a job interview. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's versatile. And, uh, you know, and while you're at it, order crab cakes, guys. Jimmy's has been supporting us forever. And we don't do a good enough job thanking him for it. Well, it's the holidays. We're in a given spirit, and we're giving thanks to Jimmy's Famous Seafood. I'm telling you, somebody, for the love of God, go out there and buy a box of crab cakes and give it to somebody or send it to yourself. You know, you've got, we got relatives coming in. This is the best part about it. You just order that shit. You ain't got to tell anybody anything. Yep. You're like, guys, we're having crab cakes tonight. Well, where the hell did you get crab cakes from? Well, I made them. And you're not quite lying because you didn't make them. You know, it just came from somewhere else. I'm telling you, man, they ship them straight to your door, and they're good, too. Holy shit, they're good. So, anyway, there you go. We got through, I mean, all the pitches, start, finish, uh, new segment. You wouldn't see loss. I mean, we don't. hey, if you're listening to this, we've forgotten about that loss, haven't we? We're looking ahead yep. to Wednesday. Hell, mirror. me and Big Hawk, we might get on the train and go to yep. damn Charlotte. Let's so, do it. You got anything else, Big Hawk? Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe.